Hello everyone and welcome to our webinar on how to protect your Kiwi brand. My name is Sophie and I'm an associate in Legal Vision's trademarks team. I'm joined today by my colleague Gracie who is a senior associate in the trademarks team. Before we begin, a couple of quick housekeeping items. You'll be emailed a copy of this recording following today's webinar for you to keep and refer to. You can submit any questions you may have in the chat box as we go. And we'd be grateful if you could spare a moment to complete the survey after the webinar finishes today. Webinar attendees are also eligible to receive a complimentary consultation to discuss how we can help you with trademarks. To book a complimentary consultation, leave your contact details in the survey that appears when the webinar ends. So today we're going to take you through some trademark fundamentals. We'll discuss the life cycle of a trademark with some common pitfalls and some practical steps that you can take to protect and enforce your trademark rights. At the end of the webinar, we'll be answering some of your questions. So please submit your questions throughout the webinar through the chat function and we'll answer them at the end. So I'll start by explaining what a trademark actually is. So a trademark is any sign that you use to distinguish your goods and services from those of other businesses um, and can be a business name, logo, slogan, color, sound, and even a smell. The most common trademarks that a business will initially protect are the business name and logo. Um, as your business grows, however, you might find that there are other aspects that form a large part of your brand branding and should also be protected. So an example of this is Apple. Um, so they have the name Apple registered as a trademark, the Apple logo, um, and their various product names like iPhone and AirPods. So these are all separate trademarks that Apple use to represent their company and brand. Another good example is Nike. They've got their, uh, their name registered, their company name Nike. They've got their swoosh logo and they've got their slogan, just do it. Um, another good example is um, the Cadbury uh, color. So they, that's a, it's a non-traditional trademark registration, but they've got the color trademark for the particular panther and color purple um, in relation to chocolate products. And Mr. Whippy's sound trademark um, is also for the well-known ice cream truck tune. Scent or smell trademarks are also particularly uncommon. Um, in fact, no scent trademarks have ever been successfully registered in New Zealand. Last year, a gin distillery applied to register the particular smell of their gin products as a trademark, describing it as a scent comprising the smell of the rainforest of the west coast of the South Island of New Zealand. However, the application wasn't accepted and was abandoned earlier this year. So you might have seen the TM or R symbol displayed next to a trademark. The TM symbol is used when you want to claim rights in a trademark um, and can actually be used any time before registration. So if you're yet to apply to register your trademark or it's pending with IPOMS, you can use the symbol to show the public that you consider the mark as a trademark. And once your trademark is officially registered and you've received a registration certificate from IPONS, you can start using the R symbol. So displaying the R symbol can be important for putting competitors on notice of your registered rights in a trademark. So as Gracie mentioned, the R symbol can only be used on trademarks once they have been registered. And some people don't realize that it's actually an offense under the Trademarks Act to use the R symbol on an unregistered trademark. So it's definitely worthwhile to know the difference. <clears throat> so now, excuse me. <clears throat> Turning to the difference between a business name registration and a trademark registration, this can be a really common area of confusion for businesses. So say you're establishing your business, you've incorporated your company, you've registered your business name with the New Zealand company's office, and you've secured the top level domains for your name. It can be really surprising to learn that taking all of these steps doesn't necessarily mean you'll be able to use your trademark. Your business name registration helps you to comply with the company office's requirements, but it doesn't actually give you any separate rights in the name as a trademark. 
although your trademark and your business name will often match, a business name registration and a trademark registration are two entirely separate assets. So it, it's not actually compulsory to register your trademark, although it's certainly best practice to obtain a trademark registration. And there are a number of important benefits and protection that flows from registration, which Gracie will discuss in a moment. It's also worth mentioning that aside from trademark registrations, you can also build up unregistered trademark rights. Trademark rights can begin accruing from the moment you first adopt and use a trademark in relation to your goods or services. So if you've commenced use before registering your trademark, you actually might have started accruing rights in the trademark as you have built up your reputation in the name. However, it is still best practice to register your trademark to provide you with secure enforceable rights. So moving on to the benefits of trademark registration. Uh, so a registered trademark essentially maximizes your brand protection and affords you with a number of rights, both legal and non-legal. So first and foremost, having a registered trademark provides you with an exclusive legal right to use that trademark in connection with the goods and services it's registered for. Um, so as Sophie mentioned earlier, having a business name registration doesn't provide this right. So what this means is you would have the power to commence action against anyone who is using the same or a similar trademark to you and in connection with similar goods or services. Um, and competitors, competitors are less likely to copy or misuse a trademark that's registered. And without trademark registration, it might be more difficult to stop third parties from copying your brand. Trademark registration also creates a financial asset that you can license and sell <clears throat> to third parties. Basically, you should first ensure that you have registered rights to a trademark before giving someone else permission to use your trademark. So this would be relevant if you franchise your business, for example, um, to make sure that you have maximum control over how your franchisees will use your trademarks and branding. On a similar note, uh, you shouldn't be selling your trademark to someone else without having trademark registration in place. Um, this is particularly relevant should you ever want to sell your business um, and it's something that a purchaser will usually want to know before buying the business. Trademark registration is also important for attracting investment for your business. Um, in fact, most investors will want to know if you have trademark protection for your brand because it increases your brand's credibility and reduces the risk of disputes with competitors. Um, so this means that investors can invest in your business with a greater sense of security. Finally, registering a trademark will significantly increase your business's professional image and reputation. So being able to promote your trademark alongside the registered R symbol shows to customers that you take your business and brand seriously um, and intend to be around for a while. Okay, so let's go through a brief rundown of the typical trademark application life cycle. At the very beginning, when you're considering the trademark that you want to adopt for your business, it's really important to make sure this trademark is actually available for your use and registration. It's much better to find out in the early stages if another business already has existing rights in this trademark, rather than having to rebrand down the track. Getting it right from the beginning can save a lot of time and expense later. So make sure you get your preliminary searches carried out in the early stages of trademark selection. Once you've selected your trademark, it's then time to apply to register it. In New Zealand, trademark rights are administered by a government department known as the Intellectual Property Office of New Zealand. So this is where we file applications to register trademarks. When we prepare a trademark application, we include details of the trademark to be protected, whether that's a word, logo, slogan, or otherwise. Details of the trademark owner. So this is usually a company, but it can also be an individual. And a list of the goods and services for which you use or intend to use your trademark. So goods and services are categorized into 45 different classes. Classes one to 34 are goods classes and classes 35 to 45 cover different categories of services. 
Some of the more, more common uh, classes of protection are class nine for software goods, class 25 for clothing and footwear goods, and class 36 for financial services. So then within each class that we include in the application, we prepare a list of the actual goods and services that you provide or that you intend to provide under the trademark. And getting this right is really important because it forms your eventual scope of protection. All right, so <clears throat> once you've prepared and filed an application with IPONS, <clears throat> it will be assigned to an examiner who will review the application to ensure it meets the requirements for registration. <clears throat> um, so in New Zealand, this usually takes around 15 working days of receiving the application. If your trademark application doesn't meet the requirements for registration, you'll receive what's called a compliance report from IPONS. That report will outline the issues with your application and you'll be given around 12 months to address and respond to these issues. Um, and we'll come back to discussing common problems with trademark applications in a moment. If your trademark meets all the requirements or you're able to overcome any issues within the relevant time frame, it will then be advertised for a three month period in which third parties might oppose the registration of your trademark if they perceive a conflict with your trademark. Uh, from what we've see, seen, only a small percentage of trademarks are opposed, uh, but if it does happen, we suggest seeking advice from a trademark professional to understand your options and the likely prospects of successfully defending an opposition. So once your application passes the three month advertisement and opposition period, your trademark will be registered and you'll receive a certificate of registration from IPONS. Um, even if the entire process goes smoothly, it's worth noting that a trademark can't be registered in New Zealand before six months have passed from the filing date of your application. Um, and upon registration, your trademark is protected for an initial period of 10 years across New Zealand and can be renewed every 10 years after that. So in New Zealand, the entire application process from filing through to registration takes around six months if all goes smoothly. But as Gracie mentioned, if any obstacles arise during examination, we'll have around 12 months to resolve these. So let's now discuss some common obstacles that might arise during examination of a trademark application and the ways they can be addressed or avoided. One of the more common grounds of, of objection in New Zealand is descriptiveness or non-distinctiveness of a trademark. Examiners will assess every trademark application to see whether the trademark applied for is unique enough to function as an exclusive badge of origin for your goods or services. So if your trademark is descriptive of your goods or services, it's unlikely to be actually registrable as a trademark because no single trader should own a monopoly in a descriptive or commonly used term. But bear in mind that a trademark might be descriptive in respect of some goods or services, but not others. So for example, Apple is obviously registrable for electronic devices in class nine, but it wouldn't be registrable in respect of fresh fruit in class 31. Now, if we encounter an objection from the trademarks office because the examiner thinks your trademark is descriptive, there are actually still a few options for attempting to overcome this type of objection. Firstly, we might consider filing legal submissions. So if we disagree with the assessment of the examiner, we can essentially put forward arguments about why we think the trademark should still be entitled to registration. In submissions, we refer the examiner to relevant case law to support our arguments. Um, as well as examples on the trademark register of other trademarks with a similar level of descriptiveness that were accepted. Another option uh, that we may consider is preparing and filing your evidence of use. Uh, the purpose of this is to demonstrate to the examiner that because of your use and promotion of the trademark over time, it's acquired distinctiveness at the date of filing your application. So in other words, consumers have actually come to recognize it as a badge of origin for your business exclusively. The length of use required depends on the level of inherent distinctiveness in the trademark. So the more descriptive your trademark is, the more substantial your evidence of use would likely need to be. Importantly, all of your 
use of the trademark or all of the evidence of your use that is submitted must also have been accumulated prior to filing your application. Another common way to avoid a registrability objection is to file for a distinctive logo version of the trademark. Often the additional visual elements contained within a logo can actually render the trademark distinctive overall and therefore entitled to registration. So the other common ground on which IPONS might reject a trademark application is if your trademark is identical or similar to an existing trademark and covers the same or similar goods and services. So the examiner will carry out their own search of the New Zealand database and compare any identical or near identical trademarks to yours side by side, taking into account factors such as the appearance, sound, the idea of the trademarks, um, type of customers who might purchase the goods and services, among other factors. Um, so to give you an example, say you wanted to register a trademark for Aqua Dental, for dentistry services in class 44, um, and there's an existing trademark for Aqua covering the same services in the same class. So in that situation, IPONS will likely raise an objection to your application. There are usually a number of options available for overcoming a conflicting trademark, which I'll briefly run through. Um, however, choosing the right option and approach to deal with the conflicting trademark can be challenging. Um, so it's recommended that you have a trademark professional help in this situation. So as Sophie mentioned, you can provide written submissions in an attempt to overcome a descriptiveness or lack of distinctiveness objection. Um, so the same can be done for a conflicting trademark objection if you disagree with the examiner's assessment. Um, alternatively, you might be able to amend your goods and services to overcome a conflicting trademark, especially if you have uh, broad claims that overlap with a conflicting trademark that has more specific claims. So any amendments to the goods or services will usually limit the scope of your trademark protection. So uh, again, we usually recommend having a trademark professional assist with this. Um, in certain circumstances, you might be able to overcome a conflicting trademark by supplying evidence that your trademark was adopted honestly and used concurrently alongside the conflicting trademark with no instances of public confusion or that it uh, actually existed before the conflicting trademark was applied for. Another option might be to approach the owner of the conflicting trademark um, to see if they would be willing to provide written consent to your use and registration of your trademark. So this might be appropriate for when you believe there's no commercial conflict between the trademarks. So for example, if the trademarks are used in entirely different industries and have different target consumers. Um, there are, however, risks when seeking consent. Um, that includes putting the owner on notice of your application and intended activities under the trademark. Uh, so this strategy should be treated with caution. Finally, you can apply to have a conflicting trademark revoked or removed from the register if you have reason to believe that it hasn't been used for three years or more. Um, you could also potentially use this as leverage to encourage consent from the owner if you go down the path of seeking consent. Um, a trademark professional, again, can help you investigate and assess whether there is, in fact, any use of the trademark. And you should be relatively confident that the trademark hasn't been used before applying to revoke it. Um, and that's because a revocation action can be costly if it's contested. Okay, so that was just a very brief overview of the trademark application process. Now we'll look at some common trademark pitfalls and how to avoid them. One of the most important things to bear in mind is that once you have your trademark registration in place, you should still actively monitor and enforce it to avoid having your rights eroded. We'll discuss this in a bit more detail soon, but some key pitfalls to be aware of are losing your trademark due to non-use, having your rights eroded by allowing third parties to make unchallenged use of your trademark, or a di dilution of your brand by third parties using and registering similar trademarks, resulting in a marketplace that is crowded with similar trademarks to yours. 
Another common issue that we see is when trademark applicants don't get their scope of protection right in the beginning. So I mentioned earlier that trademarks are registered in, in respect of 45 different classes of goods and services. It's so important to make sure you choose the right classes and adequately describe your goods and services at the filing stage. Your specification of goods and services can't be expanded after filing. So you need to get this right to make sure your eventual trademark registration gives you adequate protection for your intended activity. Also bear in mind that if you do expand your goods or services, or if you pivot into a different area after your trademark registration is in place and your new offering is not covered within the scope of your existing registration, you should file an additional application to protect your brand in respect of your new goods or services. The same goes for if you undergo a rebrand or update your logo, make sure that your trademark portfolio stays up to date. And of course, if you're unsure about whether your current activities are protected by your existing trademark registrations, a trademark professional can assist you by carrying out a gap analysis to identify any gaps in your protection. In terms of other common pitfalls, and as we highlighted earlier, a trademark registration can be revoked if it's not being used. Um, so to reduce the risk of losing your trademark, make sure that you're using it consistently across your business and for the goods or services <clears throat> it's registered for. So this might include using the trademark on your website, um, <clears throat> product packaging, and other marketing collateral. On a similar note, it's also important to use the trademark exactly how it's shown on the register um, because this is what your trademark is protected for. So this would be required if you ever need to defend the validity of your trademark or enforce your trademark against third parties. As your business evolves and grows, um, you might need to update your brand's visual presentation, such as a logo, um, to keep it relevant uh, to your business and market. In fact, most famous brands like Microsoft, Kodak and Adidas have changed their branding and logos over time. Um, and as Sophie mentioned, if you undergo a rebrand or update your trademark, then you should apply to protect this trademark. Generally speaking, you can't amend the appearance of a trademark itself once it's registered. And in most cases, you'll need to file a new trademark application. Also, aside from non-use of a trademark, which can compromise your rights in the trademark, another thing to bear in mind is that trademark rights can be lost when a trademark becomes generic. So what this means is that a product becomes so popular that consumers use the trademark to actually describe the product, whether it's manufactured by the trademark owner or by other traders. So it essentially no longer functions as a badge of origin for a single trader's products. So how do you minimise the risk that your trademark will become vulnerable? Firstly, make sure you're monitoring the use of your trademark by others and requesting or educating them on the correct use. On this point, use it correctly yourself. Your trademark shouldn't be used as a noun and should ideally be used together with a descriptor where possible so that the trademark isn't seen as the descriptor itself. So if your trademark was, for example, example escalator, you would use it in the context of referring to the escalator moving staircase. However, escalator is just one of the many examples of terms that were once exclusive trademarks but have now been lost to genericism. Other examples include aspirin, jacuzzi, band-aid and cellophane, which were once brand names but are now considered generic product names in a number of countries. All right, so before we move to Q&A, we wanted to provide some tips on how to avoid trademark disputes um, and what to do in a situation if you think someone has infringed on your trademark rights. So we discussed earlier the difference between the TM and R symbol. Uh, and while it's not a legal requirement to use a TM or R symbol in New Zealand, we strongly suggest displaying these symbols next to your trademark to maximize your brand protection. As I mentioned earlier, symbols are used to put competitors and consumers on notice that you have a trademark um, and can communicate to potential infringers to tread with caution. 
it's particularly important to display the R symbol once your trademark is registered um, as that can serve as a way to put competitors on notice of your registered rights and deter third parties from potentially infringing on your trademark. Aside from other people potentially infringing your rights, you should also bear in mind that you don't want to land yourself in hot water by infringing on any other third party's rights. So as we discussed earlier, this can be avoided by carrying out preliminary searches before adopting any new trademark or expanding into different categories, um, just to make sure that there are no existing prior rights that might prevent your proposed use and registration. And on that note, the Trademarks Act in New Zealand actually defines when a registered trademark is infringed. Um, in a nutshell, though, a person will have infringed another, another's trademark rights if they use a trademark which is either identical or confusingly similar to a registered trademark. Um, and the person must also use that trademark in relation to identical or similar goods and services that the trademark is registered for. So to use Apple as an example again, um, if a technology company were to use an image of an Apple as a trademark, they might be infringing the trademark rights of the existing technology company, Apple. Um, however, a company which sells apples and other fruits can feature an, an apple in their trademark. And that's because this is in a completely different area of interest and consumers are unlikely to confuse it with the technology company. Um, having said that, there are a number of circumstances where a trademark might not be infringed, um, and we'll touch on some defences to trademark infringement in a moment. So as I mentioned earlier, after your trademark has been registered, it's still important to monitor and enforce it where necessary. Keep an eye on competitors, keep an eye on trademark office filings in your classes of interest and keep an eye on the marketplace so that you can act swiftly if a third party starts making unauthorized use of your trademark. A useful quick tip for identification of infringement um, can be setting up a trademark monitoring program, which could involve regular searches of internet listings or industry specific databases or marketplace platforms for any third party use of your trademark. It's really important to act quickly to deter any infringers because as we discussed earlier, trademark rights can actually start accruing from the use of a trademark. So you don't want to give third parties any chance to start accruing any substantial rights in the trademark. The first step we usually take is to send a cease and desist letter to the infringing party. And this puts them on notice of your rights. Um, it details the offending conduct that you have an issue with and it provides them with a deadline to cease this conduct. In some cases, particularly where it's an innocent infringement, a cease and desist letter can be all it takes to resolve the matter. So when it comes to enforcing your trademark, um, it's important to get legal advice to understand your rights before taking action. Not every case is black and white and the infringer might have certain defences they could rely on. On the flip side, if you've received a legal letter demanding that you take action, um, you, you must understand your rights before responding to it. Defences apply both ways and a trademark professional can help you assess whether there are any that you could potentially claim. Some of the more common defences to direct trademark infringement are where there has been descriptive use. For example, if the term is being used to describe an aspect of the party's business or goods or services, rather than actually being used as a trademark or a badge of origin. Or where the second party has adopted the trademark honestly and has been using it concurrently for a period of time. So this comes back to what I said earlier about taking swift action. For example, if you were to ignore infringing use for a number of years, but then later on decided to try and get the other party to stop using the trademark, they may be able to rely on this honest and concurrent use defence to infringement. Or where a second party has prior use of the trademark. So this is a situation where it's particularly important to do your research. You don't want to send a strongly worded cease and desist letter alleging that another party has copied your trademark only to receive a response pointing out that they in fact started using the trademark prior to you. 
So as a first step in attempting to resolve an issue like this, we would recommend getting advice from a trademark professional. We can carry out the background research required, advise you on the strength of your rights versus those of the other party, and ensure that you're taking the best approach to resolving the matter. As a final point, we should mention that your trademark protection forms only one part of a business's overall IP protection strategy. Your trademark registration is just one tool in, a, in an IP protection toolbox. So when you combine it in a full IP protection strategy, for example, including things such as your online terms of use, um, IP clauses in agreements like manufacturing and distribution agreements, or IP clauses in employment agreements, um, then you're really putting yourself in the best position to protect your business's IP. All right, so we've reached the end of the presentation now, which we hope you found informative. Um, you might also find our free publication on Trademark Essentials Helpful, which you can download from the handout panel. We also have an upcoming event that might be of interest to you. It's on understanding your tech business's compliance obligations, um, and it'll be held on Tuesday, 28 February at 11 a.m. You can register by following the link that's on the screen and also on our website. All right, so we're going to answer your questions shortly, but while you submit them, I'll just take a minute to tell you about our membership. So Legal Vision's membership is a cost-effective alternative to the expensive hourly rates you experience with other law firms. For an affordable monthly fee, you receive cost certainty and all-inclusive legal services. So this includes unlimited document review, including drafting, amending, and reviewing business contracts and commercial leases. Um, it also includes unlimited advice consultations, and we've got a team of over 100 specialist lawyers, including business structuring, employment, disputes, and more. And of course, unlimited trademark applications, both in New Zealand and Australia. As a Legal Vision member, you won't worry about the cost of lawyers ever again. Think of it as having your own in-house counsel. We'll take care of all the business's usual legal work, so you can focus on running your business. And if you are in-house counsel, our membership is a cost-effective solution for outsourcing additional legal work. To learn more about how our membership can help you, request a free consultation when the survey appears at the end of this webinar. Okay, fantastic. So we'll move on to answering some of your questions now. Um, and the first one we have here is, I would like to know about international protection of trademarks. Is there such a thing as a worldwide trademark like Coca-Cola? Um, surely you don't buy a trademark for every country. Sophie, did you want to? Yeah, there's that? a couple of, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, there's a couple of questions that have come in about international protection. Um, so I think probably the first thing to bear in mind there is that uh, trademark protection takes place on a country by country basis. So there's no real such thing as a, as a worldwide trademark. Um, but the, the first thing you want to start doing is having a think about your target markets and the, and the countries in, in which you want to provide your goods and services. Generally, it's best practice to protect your brand by registering your trademark in all countries in which you're trading or offering your goods and services under your trademark. Um, basically, because the last thing you want to do is launch into a new market and find out that someone is already operating under your trademark, providing similar goods or services. Um, so there are two main pathways you can take to apply internationally. Firstly, you can apply directly to your countries of interest, which will usually require you to appoint a local agent to, to file your application with the trademark office in that country and then deal with any examina examination issues if they arise. Um, and each country has their own examination time frame and registration requirements, so it's best to get that help from a professional in that country. And, and so while the Australian examination process, for example, takes between seven to eight months, if no issues arise along the way, the Canadian Trademarks Office is currently taking between about two to three years to examine applications. Um, but the alternative pathway and one that's most popular if you're looking at filing in multiple countries is via the Madrid Protocol. So this involves filing one application that's registered with the World Intellectual Property Organization and then it's sent off to the individual countries that you nominate for examination. 
However, not all countries are members of the Madrid Protocol. So for those countries um, like Hong Kong and South Africa, for example, um, you would need to apply directly to those trademark offices. But it's definitely worthwhile chatting with a trademark professional about your options so you can weigh up which filing pathway is best for you, which would depend really on your international target market. Okay, so another question is, does this also cover Australia as well as New Zealand? Um, so like <clears throat> Sophie mentioned, <clears throat> trademark protection is on a country by country basis. So a trademark in New Zealand, the short, <clears throat> short answer is, <clears throat> a, a trademark in New Zealand would only provide protection within New Zealand. It wouldn't extend to Australia. So if you're also trading in Australia or intend to expand there, then you should also consider applying for a trademark there. Um, so another question that I might give to you, Sophie, how about yeah. someone overseas providing services virtually to clients in New Zealand, but not actually based or registered in New Zealand? Yeah, so this just touches on what I was saying earlier. Even if you're not actually based in that country, if you're providing your services to New Zealand or to, to clients in New Zealand, or to clients in, in any other country, it is best practice to still register your trademark in that country because, as I was saying, you don't want to then you know find out that someone else is trading under that trademark or a similar trademark in New Zealand already and then essentially prevent you from expanding into that market. Cool. Um, another question is, can I add classes to my trademark in the future? Um, so generally speaking, you won't be able to add classes or goods and services once your trademark application has been filed. Um, so if you begin offering goods and services in a different area, you'll need to file a new trademark application in most cases. Um, so say for example, your registered trademark is protected for clothing in class 25, and two years later, you um, you begin selling handbags and wallets. So these goods are covered in class 18. So in a case like this, you should consider filing a new application covering these goods in class 18. Um, as a rule of thumb, if you intend on providing certain goods and services within the next few years, then we'd recommend including these in your application from the outset to ensure you have adequate protection and to save you from having to refile later on. Um, on the other hand, if you don't use your trademark for all the goods and services it's registered for, then you might risk losing your trademark as we mentioned earlier. Um, so it's important to bear this in mind when you're working out what goods and services will protect you for your current and intended activities under the trademark. Oh, so another one that's come in is, should I register my logo in colour or black and white? So it's a good question. Um, in New Zealand, we're lucky because you can register your logo in any colour and enjoy protection for use of that logo in any colour scheme and practice. Usually, you would register your logo in the colour you use most predominantly, um, but then your trademark rights would extend to use in any colour. I guess the exception to this is where colour is maybe a, a really distinctive part of your trademark or it's an element that you want to claim as part of your trademark, particularly where, say, consumers have really come to identify that colour with your brand. Um, and in those cases, you might include an endorsement or a, a limitation on your application to make it clear that you're actually claiming those colours as distinctive features of your trademark. However, I guess it's important to, to keep in mind there that this would limit your protection to use of that trademark in that particular colour. But the position is different across the world, so it's worthwhile getting some guidance on the best representation of your logo to register, depending on how you're using your logo in practice. Cool, so another question, how do I know when is the best time to apply for a trademark? So in terms of timing, this will largely depend on the current priorities of your business. Um, so from what we've seen, sub businesses will consider applying for a trademark as part of the other preliminary steps of setting up the business, whereas other businesses might consider trademark registration after having traded for a number of years already. Um, so I guess there's no black and white answer, um, but as a rule of thumb, the sooner you apply for a trademark, the better. 
Um, and this is because once you file a trademark application, you secure what's called a priority date, which is the date on which your application is given preference or, or priority over later filed applications. Um, so we usually recommend applying for your trademark and securing your priority date before or at the time of commencing use of your trademark. Um, and this reduces the chances of a third party filing an application to register a similar trademark to you, um, which could complicate the registration of your trademark. And to add to Sophie's comments earlier about filing internationally, um, if you apply for your trademark overseas within six months of your priority date in New Zealand, then in most cases, you can actually have your overseas application backdated to the priority or filing date of New Zealand application. Um, so as an example, say you filed your trademark application in New Zealand today on 6 December, and then you later apply for the same trademark in the US and Canada three months later on 6 March. So by including a priority claim, the priority date of the US and Canadian application will be treated as 6 December instead of the actual filing date of 6 March. Again, having an earlier priority date overseas reduces the chances of a third party applying for a similar trademark before you. Okay, so this is kind of an interesting one. Can I register my business method as a trademark? So there's an important distinction here because trademarks protect aspects of your brand rather than the ideas, the, the concepts or the methods behind the operation of your business. Um, and I guess also importantly, ideas themselves can't be protected, but once they're expressed in material form, like on paper, in a movie, etc., cetera, um, they might find protection through other avenues, maybe through copyright, which is an automatic right in New Zealand, or possibly via patent protection, but that's a story for another day. Um, I, as I mentioned earlier though, trademark protection is just one of the ways you can protect your IP as a whole. So you should consider other ways you could protect your business model or protect your trade secrets, um, such as through IP clauses and confidentiality clauses in contracts with third parties or your employees. Uh, but on the other hand, if you have developed a particular logo or a pictorial representation of your business model that's unique to your business, or perhaps you've developed a catchy name for your method, um, these are the types of circumstances where you might consider trademark protection in order to obtain exclusive rights in these aspects of your branding. Okay, so I think we have one more question. Um, so what is considered as a descriptive trademark? It's a good question. So broadly speaking, if an IPONS examiner raises a descriptiveness or lack of distinctiveness objection, this means that your trademark is considered not capable of distinguishing your goods or services from those of other traders. Um, so as Sophie highlighted earlier, it's difficult for a single trainer, trader to gain a monopoly or otherwise trademark rights in a descriptive or generic term, which is likely to be used by other traders in the ordinary course of business. Um, so an obvious, obvious example would be fresh flowers for a floristry, which would be very difficult to register as a trademark. Um, descriptive trademarks are assessed on a spectrum, so to speak, um, to determine how strong or weak the trademark is. Um, I'd say the most successful trademarks are often invented words, or a unique combination of words, which is unlikely to be generic, like Google or Facebook. Um, however, if you receive a descriptiveness objection, and depending on the strength of your trademark, you might be able to overcome the objection if you can prove that your trademark has acquired distinctiveness over time, as Sophie mentioned. Okay, I think that's the end of the Q&A. Thanks so much again for joining us and don't forget to request your free consultation through the survey that you'll receive shortly. Thanks everyone, hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks everyone.